Paul settles for a while in the city of Ephesus, but soon the fruit of his labors comes to bear as a riot forms against the Christians in the city. On the Bible Brief. An ancient Greek poet commenting on the magnificence of the Temple of Artemis in the city of Ephesus. I have set eyes on the wall of lofty Babylon, on which is a road for chariots, and the statue of Zeus by the Alpheus, and the hanging gardens, and the colossus of the sun, and the huge labor of the pyramids of Egypt, and the vast tomb of Mausolus. But when I saw the temple of Artemis that mounted to the clouds, those other marvels lost their brilliancy. Paul's mission had taken him to the city of Ephesus, home of one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis. And as you might guess, Paul's message would cause great trouble to this city so steeped and so dependent upon idolatry. Over the last several years, Paul had continued sharing the gospel in city after city. He'd spent over a year in the city of Corinth, preaching and teaching, making disciples, and meeting new ministry partners. And later, he was able to return to Antioch in Syria to update the church on the happenings during his second missionary journey. He told them about meeting Timothy at Lystra, about the prison door swinging wide open for he and Silas in Philippi, and he told them of the amazing opportunity he'd had at the Areopagus in Athens to confront the false philosophies of the day. It was a journey with great success, and the gospel was reaching more places than ever before. Though only a minority of the Jews had become believers, great numbers of the Gentiles did believe, and the global church was growing through the ministry of Paul and others. After updating and strengthening the church at Antioch, though, Paul set out on another journey, and this time one of his major stops would be the city of Ephesus. So this time, taking a journey by land, he came to the city to discover not total ignorance to the gospel, but an incomplete proclamation of it. When Paul arrived at Ephesus, he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about twelve men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when they had become stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of the region heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Paul found some men who appeared to believe in the coming Messiah, but they hadn't yet been given the connection that this Messiah had come and his name was Jesus. They didn't apparently believe in Jesus, nor did they know about the Holy Spirit. They believed in the coming Messiah and yet missed that this Messiah had already come. It's as if they were stuck believing what John the Baptist preached without realizing that the Messiah he preached had come died, risen, ascended, and sent the gift of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. Paul, upon perceiving this in these men, then shared Jesus with them, baptized them, and saw the Holy Spirit come upon them. Barely had he arrived in the town of Ephesus, and the gospel was already bearing fruit in the city, and it would bear fruit for a few years as Paul expanded his ministry in Ephesus into the surrounding areas. The impact of the gospel became so great during that time that many who formerly practiced magic arts repented of their pasts and brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found that it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. People were seeing that nothing is worth more than a relationship with God. 
Nothing is more valuable than God himself, and no one should be worshipped but God alone. Though their fortunes were in demonic and false practices, they turned their backs on that life for a life with God. It was an amazing and fruitful time that began to affect not just the lives of the believers in the area, but it even came to have economic effects on the city of Ephesus. And this was where resistance to the gospel began to mount. At about that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of the region, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all in the region and the world worship. Demetrius the idol-maker begins to form a coalition of craftsmen to oppose the message of Paul, who had apparently become famous in the region for sharing the gospel. So many people in and around Ephesus had come to faith and turned away from idols that the very economy of idolatry was threatened. All these idol-makers were fearing that they would soon be out of a job, and they even feared, perhaps, that this great temple of Artemis could come to nothing. Demetrius began to gather a crowd of these workmen. And soon, a chant broke out as they went through the city on the way to the town gathering place, a large amphitheater. Angrily, they chanted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! They rallied around their goddess of fertility and prosperity, while they gathered more and more to their cause. Soon, they dragged a few of Paul's companions into the amphitheater, and other disciples had to convince Paul not to go in himself. Now craftsmen were there, Jews were there, Christians were there, and the town leadership was there as well. But in the midst of this confusion, the chant continued, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Finally, after two hours of utter chaos and confusion among the crowd, the town leader raises his voice to convince the raucous crowd to quiet down. He says, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemous of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. The leader of the town is increasingly concerned that the city might be officially charged with rioting a serious offense against the Roman Empire that would be followed by something like martial law in the city. Citizens would have restricted rights if they were charged, and this leader didn't want it to come to that. And so he makes a case that Demetrius and company ought to simply go to the courts if they have an issue with the Christians. A riot was not the way to handle their frustrations. And apparently, his reasoning settled the crowd enough that it began to disperse, and the riot disbanded before it lost total control. This is a lesson for Christians. The message that we share is not one that's merely believed by the heart, though that's a necessary first step. It's a message to be believed in action as well. When the Holy Spirit comes into a person, He confronts the person, He convicts the person, and while we all may go at a different pace, the Spirit gets to work. The books of magic arts get thrown away. The constant vices become yesterday's vices. The idols of the heart are destroyed and forgotten. Paul would say it this way in a letter he later wrote to the church in Ephesus. He said this, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. 
They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Christians appeal to people to believe in the Savior. And when they do, just as it happened to us, they change from the inside out. It affects their daily lives, their conversations, their vocations, their emotions, and their decisions. At scale, it affects families, neighborhoods, communities, cities, and nations. But it all starts when one person has the courage to share the good news with someone who needs it. Paul did it in Ephesus, and God calls us to do the same in our own lives. It didn't happen that day, or even that century. But eventually, as Christianity continued to propagate across the region around Ephesus, those idol makers did go out of business. Artemis was dishonored among the false gods, and the great temple of Artemis, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, was reduced to stacks of stones in a little-known field. The words of the gospel may just be words on their own, but they carry a power that topples the greatest strongholds the world has ever seen. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible.